Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of Alice and Mark and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we gather to spend time in the Word, that we might become more like Jesus Christ. His precious Word. Yes, by the power of the Father working yes. through His Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Uh, last week we started a study, a line by verse by verse study, uh, in Paul's first letter to Timothy. So we're going to pick that up again today. But remember that it says that God has made everything with its purpose. Mm -hmm. Our purpose here, we have a purpose, and that purpose is that we abide in His Word, that we know His Word, that we might know the truth, the truth that makes us free, and that we would become obedient to the Word. That's how we look like Jesus Christ. That's right. okay. There was one thing that Jesus was. He was obedient to the Father, the will and wishes of the Father. Amen. All right, so we're going to start that, pick up where we left off now. We left, left off, we were in uh, verse 10, I believe, of the first chapter, talking about the law. So we're, we're going to pick that up, and I'll be reading from the end of 10 and, and beginning of uh, verse 11. But before we do that, Brother Mark is going to ask God's blessing on our time together. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for the word and just put it in our hearts and our souls so we can spread it to other people and just for your glory. Amen. 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 So remember, we were talking about the law. And if anybody taught about the law in, in New Testament times, it's the Apostle Paul, right? And he's saying that the law is good. Mm -hmm. Now, I think a lot of Christians today perceive the law as bad. It has never been bad, all right? Mm -hmm. Well, there's an if there. We know that the law is good if it's used the right way. It can be used the wrong way. Anything can be used the wrong way. Anything can be. But inherently, the law is good in and of itself is good. It's the Word of God. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it, everything God made is good. <clears throat> well, I mean, Timothy, not here in 1 Timothy, but in 2 Timothy, says that all Scripture, all Scripture starts at Genesis 1, is God-breathed. Mm -hmm. Now, God's breath brings life. All right? Yes. We want to mature in our faith, and the Word does that. We're, we're molded and shaped by the Word. But yes, it has to be used properly. The problem was, I mean, it has, it's like a dual purpose thing. But Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, don't think I came to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. But then he says, well, you know, we, we still have to learn from it. And I, we talked about this a bit last week. It says in the Old Testament, the law is a tutor to lead us to Christ. Mm -hmm. Which says that in the New Testament. But having come to that place where we know Christ Jesus, the law doesn't get tossed. No, not at all. I mean, which, what part of the law are you going to toss? The part that says that we're to love God with all our heart? The part that says we're to honor our mother and fathers? The part that says that we're not to profane the name of God? Well, I mean, of course, there's a lot. What happened was man didn't have an understanding of it. And if you don't have a right relationship with God the Father through the atoning work of Jesus Christ, the law is always going to be over you. You're going to be under the law. But once you have that right relationship with God the Father through the atoning work of Jesus Christ, you ride the glory of the Word Amen. and are blessed by the Word. You are blessed by all of God's Word because all of God's Word is profitable for training in righteousness. We need to be trained in We are righteous, made righteous by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But we need to grow in that understanding of righteousness. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that's what God's Word can accomplish. How much of the New Testament is nothing more than quoting the Old Testament? Okay. But what, what Paul wrote here to say in 2 Timothy is that the law is not made for a righteous person. Right. In other words, because it doesn't need, you don't need the law to bring you to a righteous state. Mm -hmm. the, law, the law cannot accomplish that. It can make you aware of the fact that you're unrighteous, which should lead you to repentance, Right. And we talked about the royal law of love. That's New Testament stuff. Mm -hmm. Because the goal of our instruction is love, all right? But the law, it says in, in verse 10, right? Mm -hmm. That the law was made for those who are lawless and rebellious. Mm 
That's nine. That's nine. Okay. Ungodly and sin. The people who are ungodly and sinners. Mm -hmm. The people who are unholy and profane. The people who kill their fathers and mothers. The murderers. Immoral men and homosexuals. Kidnappers, liars, and perjurers. And whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. Let me, let me tell you. There is sin in the world. You may have mm -hmm. noticed. Yes. And the law was made to restrain them. Mm -hmm. It's made for the evildoers. The reason we have speed limits on the roads is because you can't trust people to drive safely right. without it. You can't trust them to drive because men, particularly in these last perilous last days, they're lovers of self. And the only concern they have is for themselves. But I mean, you know, ungodly and sinners, uh, that's made up of the unholy and profane. Profane. Profane is the other side of the uh, coin that is fanatic. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, oh. Because they both come from the same Latin word, phantom, and that meant in the temple, all right? So if you're, if you're a fanatic, it meant that you're in the temple. If you're profane, it meant that you're outside the temple. We, we used to, I mean, when I was young and growing up, profanity wasn't allowed. I mean, Not you know, no. I'll tell you what, my mommy would wash my mouth out <laughs> with soap. That's the truth. That's right. Because that's language outside the temple. Right. All right? Today, profanity is more than accepted. I mean, it be, has become a necessary part of communications out there in the world. I can't, I can't believe how profane the language is yes, out there. Yeah. And what a change that's taken place in, it in one generation. It's, it's mind-boggling. People who kill, murderers. I, I don't know, when was, this, when was this last school shooting? A couple of weeks ago. Was it? I think two weeks ago. Are there murderers out there? I mean, it, it doesn't, there's no sanity involved in this, okay? Immoral men and homosexuals. Immorality. I, I can't, it's like, thank God we are sealed in the Holy Spirit. Because living here on this planet right now is like living in a sewer. There's so much profanity, immorality. Homosexuality is a sin. Yes. Hello, let me say that. Because homosexuality has gone in my adult lifetime, in my adult lifetime, from being prohibited by law mm -hmm. to being permitted to being... Promoted, I missed the one that I usually tell. Or preferred. Well, it, it, it preferred, but it's, I, I don't, it, it's promoted. It is absolutely promoted today, okay? That's a change that's taken place in one generation, in my generation. But it says whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. What's contrary to sound teaching? Not living according to God's word. Anything not done, anything not done in faith is sin. Mm -hmm. And faith comes by hearing God. If you're not spending time listening to God and then acting upon what you've heard from him, you're living in sin. But none of those things that I just talked about, none of those are about love. No. Unless you're talking about being a lover of self. Remember, that's what Paul said in, second, mm -hmm. in his second letter to Timothy in the third chapter, in the perilous last days, or in the, in the last days, those perilous times have come, and it starts with men being lovers of self. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that includes homosexuality. I, I just want to say this. Homosexuality is not, I'm going to say this, it's not about love. Yeah. It's about sex. There is no prohibition in Scripture about a man loving, loving a man. man. Right. Au contraire, as we say in France, mm -hmm. there is a command of God that we love one another. That we love other men. I love, I love Mark. I just don't want to have sex with him. <laughs> Hello. It, because homosexuality is about sex. Okay? It's unnatural. It's, un, it's unnatural. And if you go on your own, do a little homework, and read Romans chapter 1, Paul's letter to the Romans, you will see the root of the, of the problem of homosexuality. Okay. So then let me go to verse 11. What Paul is talking about is according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Well, you know, 
God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah, and he said, if you run with the footmen and they've tired you out, how will you run with the, with the, with the horses? Mm -hmm. If you're not faithful in the little things, you're not going to be faithful in the big things. God entrusted Paul with the gospel because he knew Paul would be faithful right. in the big things because he knew he could be faithful in the little things, all right? In verse 12, Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Because God considered him serve, faithful, faithful, he entrusted him with the gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, the parable Jesus told about he entrusted, a, a man went off and left and trusted his servants with funds, right? Mm -hmm. And in Matthew 25, 21 it says, when he returned, there was one, and, he, and his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. I promise you, if you are saved, if you are a servant, of, you are a servant, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Are you being faithful in the little things? Why would you expect God to, be, to entrust you with big things if, you if you're not being faithful in the little things. Yeah. You know, I, I've talked about this when it comes to, to power. Why would God give us power if we're not being faithful in the little things? Little things like, I just said, obeying the speed limits. If you're not doing that, why would he trust you with some, <clears throat> with the ability to do miraculous things? Okay, let's, let's move on. I want to go to 13. In 1 Timothy 1, 13 and 14, Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. Paul had been formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. <coughs> He is not easy on himself. Well, how about ISIS? Mm. They're violent aggressors. Yes, persecutors, <clears throat> violent aggressors. And blasphemers. Well, I don't, I don't know why we can't see the simple truth of this, what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, that we're to love our enemies. We're to pray for our enemies. <laughs> you know, the, the way to deal... We Christians have a different ministry than the world. And we're going to get into that in this yes. study of Timothy. Okay? Absolutely, yeah. It is not our ministry to punish evildoers. Right. It is not our ministry to go out there and kill those people. It is our ministry to bring <coughs> life. The Word of God says that we have a ministry of reconciliation. That's to reconcile people to God the Father by proclaiming the atoning work of Jesus Christ. That's our ministry. So we need to be praying. I'm not saying that those you know, people like ISIS or people like the school shooters or anybody else, I'm not saying that they shouldn't be punished. They should be. But that's the ministry of the government. Paul talks about that here in the letter to Timothy, the first letter to Timothy. It's not our ministry. So we need to, we need to recognize that if God could change the heart of a man like Paul, who was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor, whose heart can he not change? He can change anybody's heart. All they have to do is receive what he has to give, all right? And, and turn away from their sin and turn to, to him. Jesus Christ. Amen. Because, because, he goes on to say right here, the grace of our Lord was more than abundant. Mm -hmm. God's grace is, is more than abundant. You were saved by amazing grace. Absolutely. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. You know, we were talking about this, we were having a conversation the other day about the, the, the gospel and the word of the cross. We have a, a page that I put up on Bible Talk years and years and years ago. And it starts out, this is the good news of Jesus Christ. And the good news of Jesus Christ starts with this. You're a dirty, rotten sinner. Yes, we are. Because until you recognize that fact, until you recognize how bad a situation is, you don't need good news. Mm -hmm. And if you don't believe the bad news, and the bad news is that you're a dirty, rotten sinner, is there any clean sin? All sin is dirty and rotten. 
And if, you're, if you are that dirty, rotten sinner, there's nothing that you can do about it. You can't do anything about that. You don't have the power within you to satisfy God, to make that right. That's why it took Jesus Christ, the one without sin, to take away the stain of our sin. That There's a reason we sing Amazing Grace. Because it is amazing. And listen, my brothers and sisters, it took amazing grace to bring you into a right relationship with God the Father. It took amazing grace to bring me into a right relationship with God the Father. Amen. I couldn't do it by... By tithing, I couldn't do it by going to church a lot. I couldn't do it by giving food to the hungry. It took the shed blood of Jesus Christ to make that a truth. Verse 15. It's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. It's a trust, this is a trustworthy statement. There's no doubt about this. There's no. There should be no debate about this. This is it the should, truth. And it should ex receive full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the to the world not to create Christmas holidays. No. He came into the world to die. That's right. He stood at the end and he said, "For this reason, I came into the world." Jesus Christ was born to die. To give his life a ransom for many. Paul says that he was the foremost of sinners. Why? Because he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor. He's certainly not boasting in his evil. I, I'll tell you that. And yet, God took one who was the foremost sinner and truly made him into the foremost evangelist. And I make that statement. You see, we often try to mitigate the, the fact that Saul of Tarsus Religious as he was, and he was very, very religious, and had an incredible zeal for the tradition of the elders, was a man who hated the promised Messiah. He hated the promised Messiah of Israel and all who followed him. Paul was the ISIS of his day. He purposed in his heart to destroy Christianity. Is that not true? Yes. How'd that work out for him? Well, it worked out well for me, I'll tell you what. That's true. All right, verse 16, zooming right along now. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. If Paul was, and this is the word of God, the foremost sinner, let me tell you, whatever you've done, if, you're, if you happen to be listening to this and you don't have that right relationship with Jesus Christ yet, if you were hearing this, there is nothing that you have done, no matter how horrible, how heinous, that God cannot wash clean with the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a stain that only He removed. It's a stain that only He can remove. That's right. I mean, the first thing we see of Jesus Christ is John the Baptist, right? Saying, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That includes yours. God is a God of grace and mercy. Amen. Abundant grace. That's what it says. All you need to do is turn to Jesus Christ and ask forgiveness. Turn to God the Father and ask re to receive that forgiveness that was purchased at so great a price. And it was purchased at a great price. All right? He said, for this reason... Because Christ came to save sinners. That's what it says. He didn't came, come to save the righteous who were not. He came to save the sinners. That's what it says in the Gospel of Mark. In the second chapter of Mark, verses 16 and 17, it says, When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he, Jesus, was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And they hearing and hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. If you're sinning there and you know you knew one or something, you know the sin yes. that you have in your heart. Yes. Jesus is the physician who can heal it. And he can heal it right now. Amen. All you have to do is ask him. 
to receive what he's already done. He's already done the work. All you have to do is receive it. Receive him as your Lord and Savior. As your Lord and Savior. 1 Timothy 1.17 This is kind of ending this opening part of the letter. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So this whole thing up for these first 17 verses is basically an opening statement. Yes. And he's closing it here, and now we will get into the meat of this letter. All right? Verse 18. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight. What's the first thing you notice here? This command. This command. This yes. command. It's and not I, a suggestion. It's not a suggestion. It's not just an encouragement to do something. I've said this from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. There are no, it's not suggestions. These are the commands of God. So Paul says, this command I entrust to you. And he says, it's according to the prophecies. You know, later on in this, in this letter, in the fourth chapter, Paul writes to Timothy and says, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's prophecies. Right. These are people laying hands on them and praying God's blessing, God's word. You know, in 2 Timothy, he starts in 2 Timothy in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 6, and he says, For this reason, Paul, again, writing to Timothy, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. We, we talked about this in the very first verse. Paul didn't appoint himself an apostle. No. God did. And you can't appoint yourself an apostle <clears throat> either. You know, now God has appointed in the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. It's the word. And how does he do this? Through his word. How does he do everything? With his word. So when people, you know, will come along, godly people, who are truly being led by the Spirit of God. Not everybody's a prophet. Oh, that it were, that they were all speaking the Word of God. But when they speak the Word over you, you better be seeing that that Word is fulfilled. That's, you know, because that Word is being entrust, entrusted to you, right? And Paul is telling them, what's the purpose? Remember, everything is made for it's, that you fight the good fight. Think about these, I just want to think about these verses. Mm -hmm. In 1 Corinthians 9, 7, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Or who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? Who serves as a soldier, right? Fight the good fight. And later on in 2 Corinthians, he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. This is warfare. Yes. This is warfare. And warfare can be bloody, right? To the Philippians, Paul said, Philippians 2.25, I thought it necessary to send to you Ephroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier. This is warfare. Why, later on, in the next letter he wrote to Timothy, and he, he said to Timothy, suffer hardship with me. As a good soldier of Christ Jesus, no soldier in active duty and active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. We serve the Prince of Peace. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> but we better be prepared for the battle. That's why we're told to put on the whole armor of God. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's probably all too rare today to walk into a, a church and hear a sermon and it's not about oh how nice and soft and everything easy it's going to be if you accept Jesus oh no it's yeah. going to be a bloody battle yeah. and you better be prepared for it but I pro he doesn't promise you no, no battle what God promises is victory, victory in the battle is, right? it's already been won because it has indeed been won right. 
But don't think that it won't be that battle. Right. And then he goes on to say in verse 19, keeping faith in a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Mm. Faith and good conscience. you got to keep this. What is it? Well, getting instruction from God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, right? Mm. And knowing that you have been faithful to do what you've heard. That's how you have a good conscience. conscience right? You've been obedient. Well, that's faith and good conscience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That you are spending time hearing from God, and then you are acting upon what you've heard. Um, there's a lot about that in the New Testament. I mean, you know, otherwise you're ineffectual if you're not a doer of the Word. Okay? Right. So you, the reason you can have faith and a good conscience is they have to be coupled. Yes. It's about hearing from God and acting upon what you've heard. I mean, it's, it really is that simple. It's the Hebrew word Shema. It is the Hebrew word Shema. Very good, Alice. Yes. What does that mean? It means to hear, and it means to obey. That's correct. That one Hebrew word, which means to hear, also means to obey. It's the same word. Right. Because it is inconceivable to God that you should hear Him and not obey Him. Right. It should be inconceivable to you that, we would hear that you would hear His voice him. and not obey Him. Mm -hmm. And if, that, if you want to wrap your head around that, go read Deuteronomy chapter 28 and see about hearing and obeying. Or the other side, hearing and disobeying. Right. Okay. Right. So he's talking about the men who have rejected or, and suffered shipwreck, right? Some have suffered shipwreck. Is, they didn't have airplanes in Paul's day. Okay. Yeah. Probably the greatest disaster that could happen would be a shipwreck. The only way you could be transported would be by, uh, well, yeah, that's the way by you, ship or by yeah. the Holy Spirit. <laughs> oh, yeah, by the Holy Spirit, right. Okay. This might be substituted crash and burn. <laughs> well, it, it is. It, yeah. it really is. <clears throat> because if you're not hearing from God and obeying what you hear, you are headed for shipwreck. I mean, you're, you're headed for the rocks. You're headed for disaster. That's a fact. So in verse 20, he says, Among these are Hymenaeus, Hymenaeus and Alexander, who I have handed over to Satan, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. Mm. Wait a minute. I thought we're not supposed to be judgmental. You will know them by their fruits. This is not judgmental. Mm -mm. Okay? What, what's, he, what's he doing here? Paul names names. And it's not the only place that he does it, right? No. That's a picture of the shepherd I was just gonna protecting say the flock. Right. That's what it is. Protecting and caring for the flock. Those who have gone astray. Protecting them from those who have gone astray. We need to have that. Go read 1 Corinthians 5, where it talks about, you know, where it says we're not to judge the world, but we are to judge those inside the church. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, like he says again in 2 Timothy, their talk will spread like gangrene. And among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place and they upset the faith of some. In 2 Timothy 2, 17 18. They're teaching falsehood. That's what they're doing. And apparently, they will not repent of teaching that falsehood. So what has Paul done? He's handed them over to Satan. Well, that's pretty rough, isn't it? But it's not for their destruction... Yeah. It's for their salvation. Amen. In 2 Samuel 14, 14, God spoke through the prophet and said, God does not take away life, but plans ways so that the banished one will not be cast out from him. God has a plan, and his plan is for life. In Ezekiel 18, 23, he says, Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, rather that he should turn, away, turn from his ways and live? Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5, and he said, I have decided to deliver such a one. Now, this is not talking about Hymenaeus, somebody else. Mm -hmm. He said, I've decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. What is this called? Love. It's called discipline. And discipline is love. That's right. 
And love requires discipline. That's why we're called disciples, because God loves us. That's right. You see, it says in Hebrews 12 that all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Hebrews 12, 11. It's called discipline. It is not punishment. Okay? Mm -hmm. Let me just back up one verse, all right? In Hebrews 12, 10. It says, for they discipline, talking about our earthly fathers, they discipline us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. Okay? God has a purpose. He is a, he is a consuming fire and he is burning away the dross. The world today prohibits discipline. I mean, yes. discipline your child. You know, have the... Uh, HRS. Yeah, somebody right there. And by the way, the HRS, like the IRS, they have the ability to yeah. take action and do things without due process. Right. Without court being involved. Without yeah. due process. They don't have to take you to court. They can come. The they IRS can, the innocent. They can come and take away your money, and then you got to prove you didn't do anything mm -hmm. wrong. The same way, the, the HRS can, the take HRS can come and take away your children, and then you got to prove you didn't do anything wrong. Right. Okay? Uh, take that to your constitution and eat it. So, fathers, listen now, fathers, godly fathers, discipline their children. Governments punish evildoers. That's God's plan. That's God's plan. Right? Yes. We are supposed to discipline, to correct, to reprove, to train in righteousness. The world, on the other hand, the governments, well, uh, let me read you what Peter says. 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14, he says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. We, the church is supposed to discipline, the government is supposed to punish. Mm -hmm. Two different ministries. And when you start to confuse that and get involved in the government, you don't know what to do. And you'll never do the right thing. What's the difference between the two? Between discipline discipline is, training. is training. Punishment Isn't, is physical. Punishment? No, punishment is just to punish you for doing something wrong. Well, they might learn something after they get punished or during the punishment. If they cut off your head, I doubt it. That is true. If they electrocute you, I doubt it. But if Mark, I understand, but that's still not, listen. There was a time. There was a time they used to call them penitentiaries because yeah, they went to try and make people penitent, penitent to repent. Mm -hmm. of what the fact is, today it it's, it's, it, what it is is punishment. <clears throat> and this is the word of God. They have been given the sword to punish evildoers. It's not. It's not. It's not to train them. It's to punish them. Right. Okay. Christians are not being faithful. In their ministry, by and large, I'm making a generalization, but it's a true generalization. <clears throat> and the simple fact is, neither is the government. Mm -hmm. Right. Neither is the government, because they're they're not justice. Oh, where, where, oh, where mm -hmm. is justice? Okay, but the ministry of the church is to disciple, go out into all the world, making disciples. Right? Baptizing in the name of Jesus and baptizing and making disciples, teaching them to obey the things that he commanded. Mm -hmm. That's the end of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew 28. The government, they're, they're, just, they're just trying to, their purpose and their, their call is to protect us from evildoers. You're supposed to incarcerate them. Or, or, or do whatever. I mean, that's not up to us to judge. That's up to the judges of the world to judge. But they have to be faithful in doing that correctly. And I, I don't know that they are. Okay. Let me, uh, there's a, there's a, a rhyme and a reason to everything in this letter, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're going to stop here. But I want to just take note of the fact what we're going to pick up next week. Think about that statement. The church is there 
to a disciple with a ministry of reconciliation. The governor has a sword because he has a ministry of, of punishment. Okay? They don't... Listen, they don't care if you if you get a speeding ticket. It's not... You can say, well, maybe it'll make you learn something. Maybe it will, but typically it won't. They're just punishing you. But think how this next chapter starts. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Mm -hmm. Quiet and tranquil life. Because their ministry is to punish and protect us from the evildoers. Right. And if they do it, so we should be praying. We should be praying. We shouldn't be praying that your favorite guy gets elected. Yeah. You should be praying that whoever gets elected, because God will appoint whoever he wants in the place, mm -hmm. will be faithful to the ministry that they've been called right. to. That's the deal. Well, we'll get into that next week because uh, we've kind of run out of time. Again. Time goes by so... Quickly. Yeah, the song says time goes by so slowly, but that just simply isn't true. All right. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you that you do have a plan, and your plan is a plan for life. Mm. Lord God, we thank you that you are a Father who disciplines us in love to train us in righteousness, Lord God, that we might be what we might be perfected and brought to that place. We know, Lord God, that we are not yet what we should be. But in your word, you use your word to mold us and shape us, to train us in righteousness, to correct us, to reprove us. So we just thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for this time in your word. You. And pray, Lord, that we would take and, and meditate on it, chew on it, eat it, digest it, and it would become part of our life. So we just praise you and thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, till next week, God bless you and goodbye. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My